Greetings and salutations. So this, this video is going to be kind of a discussion around a forum post that I had recently uh, put together about the discussion of monetization and kind of missing out on the opportunity to deliver a patch or some content before the holiday season as everybody kind of goes into that va family void that they go into kind of right after Thanksgiving or pre, you know, Thanksgiving and you, you know, you get your two or three day holiday and then you kind of roll into like half, half work weeks traditionally and then you kind of hit your Christmas break around the 15th. And so um, this, this discussion is kind of wrapped around a general construct of the time when, when, DLCs or additional content should be released. And so uh, I kind of want to share uh, some thoughts, and this is really kind of based off of some experience. Um, you know, I'm in my mid-40s, and even though my voice is sounds much younger than it is, I'm, you know, uh, I'm actually quite weathered from, the, from uh, uh, my current occupation. <laughs> but um, just, just to kind of share with some, you know, but I do have almost close to 25, uh, 25 years of video game experience, you know, th playing a, a plethora of titles. My, my Steam account alone is almost 15 years old. And, um, you know, I, I got well over 500 titles on that Steam account through, through that time period of collecting uh, titles early on, I, I was able to get a lot of them through um, the the franchise packs deals that they used to do, like the THQ franchise packs, where they would sell you everything in the franchise for fifty bucks, and um, you know that's how I, I kind of increased the volume. And this video is not to flex; it's just to kind of share a context of when I when I go through the trouble of writing a post or I write. Uh, write an article or I share an opinion, it's it's through uh, a, a lifetime worth of experience. And so just for to kind of give that some relevance, when someone says something's lifetime, uh, you, you go to, you know, you go to prison and they say you have a lifetime sentence. It's 25 years. So the doctrinal term, definitional term of lifetime is a 25 year um, sentence. You know, so if you spend a lifetime doing something, it's 25 years as, as a definitional term. And, you know, if you say something says it has a lifetime warranty, traditionally it's 25 years. Sometimes the companies will write their own definition. But anyways, not to segue and to stay on topic. Uh, as, as I kind of write that post, it's a, it's a realization of um, opportunities that are available to the industry and to kind of capitalize on people's segue out of out of their professional life and into that forced holiday experience that we all go through. You know, you have to spend time with family or the kind of the wind down of the economy during this this phase where people are traditionally home more because of either the, the weather transition or the, the societal pressure of school shutting down or whatever it may be. And um, I kind of felt that the reason, uh, I hate that word felt, I, uh, I kind of seen that there was a missed opportunity to really um, you push that patch out or that, that content out a little bit, a little bit earlier. And I, th I think it would have uh, also freed up some stress on the back end for the developer or the dev team to where they're not releasing a patch immediately before Christmas and uh, the Christmas holiday, you know, and that's the assumption that that they that they uh, that they celebrate or worship Christmas. But um, you know, because that puts a crunch time on them as well. And if if you would have reverse plan that a little bit, it would have freed up some kind of some some stress, some preconditioned stress on dropping it on the fifteenth, and then having uh, you know literally less than a week. To go into the Christmas Christmas break where everything pretty much shuts down like a, that week around Christmas, and uh, and then trying to you know have a bunch of late days because maybe you release some content that once it in, hit the player base, uh, bugs started popping up just because of the volume of players and the the dynamic environment that it's in and everybody kind of going through their their play styles. 
uh, accentuate certain problems that may exist in the current system. So that's why I wrote that post. And, uh, you know, there was some good topics brought up. I mean, really good topics. And there's kind of uh, two main um, thought processes that exist in this topic. And uh, I'll pull up the I'll pull up the form post here, and let me go back to the uh, the form post, and I'll kind of share the the two constructs of the the sides of the narrative. It seems to to be taking place. So you know, my original post um, it's already on its second page, and it was kind of on that construct like. And here's the thing that some folks don't understand, and this is one side of the argument, that as a game developer, uh, you, you create a, a body of work. And with that body of work, it is, is an important to have that body of work exist and stay around as long as possible. And, by, and one of the ways to do that is to continue to contribute to that body of work. And a good cadence or a good way of doing that is just be consistent in the amount of what you contribute to that body of work. So let's say every – and it's, it's, you got to kind of be realistic about this too. So every eight weeks, every ten weeks, whatever, whatever, your ba whatever your rhythm is, is what you contribute to that body of work. So let, I think eight weeks is a good realistic cadence to implement in the contribution into your body of work. Now, a problem that arises is, um, and it's kind of a marketing ploy, is that you, you want a community. You know, Perium does a generally pretty good job in the basis of community. But it's, there, you know, there are some, some rooms for improvement. But as, as a, a basis, um, the more vocal are, you are about your projects, the more excited your community gets about stuff coming, you know, in the future. And so they, they kind of come to the forums, they go to your YouTube channel, they go to, um, you know, to kind of engage in the servers and it, you know, people are working on, uh, solutions, you know, building ships or building stuff to work on solutions to overcome complex games problems so but the here's the, here's kind of the paradox of this is with the current model you sell the game you know 2015 for 25 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever it was back then and then as we go down this road this journey together it's five years later and there's there's they're still maintaining this service and this these form discussions and employing these people Five years later, six years later, off of that initial twenty dollar, eighteen dollar, maybe Steam sell for fourteen dollar investment, but you're still getting the community interaction. You're still getting um, your participation in the community, and they're they're taking the time to reply to your post. They're, you know, and plus, it's kind of another construct. You know, time is our most valuable resource. I don't know if, if many of you folks have heard this, but time is by far our most valuable resource. And when you, when you are, um, your time is not rewarded, then you have to ask yourself, is it worth putting time and energy into this project if it's not fully capitalized or utilized to its fully extent? So just... You know, one of the ways to kind of bring this back into the fold is set up a, a, um, a monetization system. And people automatically way overshoot this and immediately think of like EA Sports to where there's predatory monetization. And there are lots of really good examples of uh, monetization. For example, I think Space Engineers does a really good job where they come out with these, it's about every quarter, they come out with a $3 um, DLC pack. And some of it's free and some of it's paid for. And the stuff that's paid for is like, it's more, generally it's kind of more along the lines of cosmetic. But, you know, if you're, if you want to support the project, and I think a lot of people actually buy the DLC just to support the product. They don't really necessarily care about the, the the additional content that they get. And so, you know, you have to realize that these folks that are working in this development project, you know, they have they, they probably got kids, they got wives, 
you know, they probably got to pay for education, clothes for their for their kids, you know, a whole sh the power bill, a whole slew of things that as our society is coming to the realization that is there's more and more pressure on fiat currency. So it's just more relevant than ever to to keep the kind of the wheels greased, keep motion going and not let things kind of burn out. And one of the ways to do that is through uh, a metered kind of cadence style DLC drop every, let's say, six to ten weeks. You know, I think eight weeks is perfect. That's two months. And you plan the projects ahead of time to what you can drop in that eight weeks. So you're realistic about the scope of your projects. And, um, you know, so that's one construct. And so let's say every eight weeks, you know, you drop a DLC and then twice a, twice a year you do a monetary project. And it doesn't even have to be, but those monetary projects are to, to generate money for larger scope projects. So let's say, you know, like the, for example, they refuse to add uh, uh, rotors and pistons into the game, you know, completely. And it's probably because that expense is so great that they can't justify doing it. And through, I would love to have pistons and rotors incorporated, you know, and through a good management, um, good kind of media outlet kind of source, uh, asset management construct, you can leverage those assets to create that project if you do it right. You know, you kind of do, maybe you do like a, a monetization project where you generate $3 and the, the scope of this project is to generate, let's say, $30,000. And that's not really to pay for what, the, what they released. It, that $30,000 is really to lean forward and pay for a complete um, NPC and monster uh, modeling rework because the textures for the modeling and 3D are really subpar in the game. When you compare them to other platforms like Seven Days to Die, their their zombies are phenomenal. Like I really think that they need to reach out to the company that does the modeling because I don't think that's done internally at uh, was it Pimp Dance or Pimp Pimp Play. I don't think that's done. I think they outsource to a secondary studio to do that modeling. And so when they come out with these monetization projects, you know, and they hit you, they, they go, hey, this is a three dollar DLC, blah blah blah, whatever. That's not to pay for that DLC that just dropped. That's to pay for the next major rework or revisit, you know, revisiting current problems that they just do not have the assets or time to deal with. And I, I understand Imperium's desire to keep a small team and to manage resources and manage um, assets and kind of keep the focus and the direction of the project internally and not let it pull away and be controlled by like shareholders and other outside influence. And I completely agree with that, that style of management. Um, but I, I also think that there is some room for some secondary courses of action that will lead to better outcomes. And, you know, you don't have to micromanage everything. You can kind of macromanage uh, the scope of your project and let individuals kind of pool the resources and do what they're good at in order to pull in this additional asset. Like some, some people just are phenomenal at, um, you know, the kind of managing forms, good discussion. Some people are phenomenal at code work. And you just, it's all about personnel management, project management, time management, resource management. Now here, here is the other scope of this discussion where when you get into like, I paid for this. I expect this project, you know, I paid my $25. I expect a working uh, version of the game to this standard. And once it's this standard, I have my playthrough and now the game has, has died, right? The game has died. There's no, they do like one or two patches after the release. And then they go on and move on to another project, right? Now, what you'll, kind of come to realize is that model in the gaming industry is pretty much dead. They're all moving to this construct of called a live service model. 
And they're, what they're realizing is the five years that it takes to develop that game under current technology, current resource and asset management, to dump that after one year and to reboot another five years of development is, is not realistic anymore. Before, you could make like a DOS game or you could make a low-res Xbox One game and it would take 18 months and then that, you know, you make, sell that game on Xbox and then it's dead after that initial launch. Maybe they do one patch to fix one or two things and then they reboot it. You know, that made sense. But now the development time swings into multi-year projects. Like I've, I've watched some of these, they talk about six years in development. And so you have to kind of put that in a construct. You have to put that into a, um, a realization that they can't abandon a game uh, after initial launch. You know, they do their one or two. And so that whole construct is I paid for it, um, and therefore it should, needs to be perfect. And I got my 60 hours of play time, and I'm, I'm ready to move on. Um, you know, that still exists. But it doesn't benefit the developer. It doesn't benefit the community. It doesn't benefit the um, the project work. It doesn't benefit the engine that it's built on. It's better to kind of continuously refine current systems and have it move forward as a live service model and to have a reasonable, manageable monetization system that is not try you know not tied into pay to win not tied into, you know, because you want to employ those people in the community that support the things that you like to do. You know, you have to think about it in a larger scope. Um, and you want those people that are, are creating a, an avenue of escape for you to be successful in their lives. You know, you want their kids to be successful. You know, you want their families to be happy so that way they, they're rewarded in the project that they're working on. So it's kind of a think big picture, big scope. And one of this, the things that I see wrong with Imperium is uh, I realize that in early access, you can't monetize, right? You can't come up with a, a construct of like, I'm still in early access, so I can't charge later, but I've been in early access, access for four years. Like, that's nuts, right? But it's because it's small a team and because the, they're not willing to um, contract out cer certain um, low, you know, low priority assets, you know, like contract out the bushes, have somebody redo all the bushes, have somebody else contract, do redo all the weapons, you know, uh, pay somebody you know, a couple thousand bucks or whatever it is, redo all the weapons, you know, um, the aiming shooting system badly needs a rework. And, and I realized that after playing seven days to guy, seven days to die, the gunplay was so much better. And, and, you know, and the reason why I use that game is because it's a direct apples to apples comparisons, voxel game in unity. And, and that's why I'm not throwing out like call of duty or some crazy other unreal four engine game. It's, apples to apples, oranges to oranges comparison. And you really, you're awakened by that when you play the contrast in the game, you know, Unity game to Unity game. Um, and Unity's never been super strong in the gunplay department. That's always been the, the, the strong point of the Unreal Engine 3 and 4 is the gunplay. You know, that's that's where you had your, your Unreal Engine tournament and, you know, They've had that for at least 10 years. And so Unity's kind of fi finally getting into the quality of refining their gunplay mechanics to where it works. But um, I could tell there's a huge difference from the Seven Days to Die to the Unity. And that, you know, that needs to be revisited. But in order to do that, you know, because they have such a small staff, they have to outsource certain projects that don't impact the direction of the game. And I think through that monetization, that speeds up that construct. So I just did this video because I feel like when I, I hate to use that word, Phil, I, I come to the realization when I write a post, when I write a post, people read that post and shoot off in an entire direction that I was not meaning or was not my intent. And I'm like, I did not write that. I did not write that. And so you get into this loop of, of negativity or naysayers in th instead of broadening the construct of 
it's important to support those folks who support you, right? It's ultimately a community. And if you are a developer and you know a guy who's really good at a certain, let's say he's a modder or an asset developer, um, it's, it's important to shoot that guy a little bit of work and be like, hey, brother, I, I realize that, uh, you know, would you, would you be willing to do a little bit of work for us? I'll shoot you, you know, I'll shoot you uh, two grand if you redo all the weapons. You know, I'll shoot you uh, a little bit of money if you can help on this project. And here's kind of another segue to this discussion is that Imperium needs to open up a certain amount of modding functionality. Like, I realize they don't want to open it up because they don't want to lose control or direction of the game. I get it. I mean, it makes complete sense. They want to keep within the confines of the game. But I, I think that they there needs to be a little bit of opening up on the modding, like 20% in the, in the scope or spectrum of things, because that's when you start to identify the modders who understand your platform and what their skill sets are. And I, a reason why I bring this topic up is because I've, I've been playing Exiles for three or four years now. i got almost probably collectively probably 2,000 hours. Steam says I have 1,600. Um, but what they did is, is they hit a hiatus at one point in their development, and they just nothing was coming out for almost a year and because they were pulling all their assets to create you know all their teamwork and development and artists and programmers to make another project and so ultimately they kind of abandoned exiles and conan exiles and so the modders started stepping in and creating dungeons and the dungeons that they created were fan fan like love projects and because they were so good, Conan was like, oh, wow, this is actually better than our existing skill set. And they brought those folks in, and so all the dungeons after that point are significantly better because they're modder-driven. And so, um, you know, that's that's important to have a certain a certain amount of mod injection, you know, because you need those modders to, to really, too to kind of keep the game fresh, and then uh, three, to find the talent to, to develop that community construct around your program, around your game, so forth. So um, I hope that, you know, this is kind of broke down into four parts. Um, you know, one is two sides of the monetization process, three, community, four, modding, is in a summary of where this 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 idea is and so it's by no means am i saying am i recommending kind of a predatory uh pay to win you know ea sports style of monetization that's not what i'm saying um but i am recommending